and apologies for the late start. We just had a scheduling conflict with uh, EGU this, this week. Uh, so today I'm happy to have uh, Subhash Adhikari uh, presenting. Uh, he got his undergraduate and master's degree from Fribvan University specializing in gravitation and cosmology. He is now completing a PhD at the University of Delaware in the Department of Physics and Astronomy, studying the turbulence-like properties of magnetic reconnection and working with magnetohydrodynamics and kinetic particle and cell simulations. We're happy to have Sebastian here today to discuss his recent work on the relation between turbulence and reconnection. Uh, with that, if you would like to take it away, Sebastian. Thank you so much, Kyle. Hello, everyone. Once again, thank you, Kyle, for providing the opportunity to present my research in this weekly online seminar series. So as he mentioned, I'm Subhas Adhikari, working with Professor Michael Say at the University of Delaware about the interrelationship between reconnection and turbulence. So in the next 35 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the turbulence-like properties, such as the energy spectrum and energy transfer in magnetic reconnection. And at the end, I will show you a deep connection between uh, magnetic reconnection and turbulence than was previously reported in the literature. So let's start with the, all right, so here's my outline. I will talk about uh, two classic pictures of reconnection. The first one would be without guide field. The second one would be with guide field. In both the cases, I will show you how the energy spectrum would look like and how the energy transfer process occurs. So let's start with the motivation. So last few decades, as you would see, have put much insight into the relationship between magnetic reconnection and turbulence. As you can see in the pictures, four examples taken, but trust me, there are a lot of literature out there. And here, people have mostly studied reconnection as an element of turbulence or turbulence driven by some instabilities where you could see the pictures of reconnection or anything that had reconnection and turbulence within the frame. So once going through this literature, we had a feeling, all right, so if we step back, then what would the picture of reconnection look like through the frame or lens of turbulence? So that was the basic question that we started with. And uh, that's, being said, what does laminar reconnection look like from the turbulence perspective? So in the next slide, all the analysis that, that you would see would be looking into the process of reconnection using the lens of turbulence. All right, so this is the simulation that we used. We basically focused all our studies using kinetic particle in cell simulation. The picture that you see in the slide is the picture of magnetic the classic magnetic reconnection picture. You can see the out of plane field here and uh, the inflow and the outflow. That's the direction that we've been using. So in our simulation, this is the grid size. This is time scale. The mass ratio is 25. The box is symmetric because of easiness in computing the Fourier spectrum. The initial temperature of ions and electrons are listed here. The initial width of the current seed is 3di. That's the normalized unit for length in peak simulation. So the initial stage of the simulation is something like this. All right, so this is the initial reconnection system we had. As you can see, once again, there are two Harris current sheet in the system. The Harris configuration of the magnetic field is given by the equation here. And in order to impose magnetic reconnection in the picture, we have initial perturbation in the magnetic field in the system. So once again, I'd like to emphasize this picture is the classical laminar reconnection picture that one would imagine. This is exactly the same as the classic gem challenge picture and no turbulence is initially imposed in the system. Uh, in contrast to what Matthews and Lemkin had in their 1986 paper where they had initial seed of turbulence, which later grew up to uh, influence the whole system. So, all right. So once again, on the uh, right-hand side, you see the out-of-plane current density for the system. On the left-hand side, you see the reconnection rate. The reconnection rate is calculated as the difference in the reconnecting flux between the X line, as you can see here, 
and here with the O line at the center of the island, and that is how the reconnection rate is calculated in a 2D picture. Likewise, on the left hand side, we see how the reconnecting flux evolves in the system. The reconnecting, reconnecting rate is initially almost equal to zero, but as the initiation phase almost about to end, the reconnecting flux decreases. So in order to characterize our study better, we divided the reconnecting phase or the total time of the simulation in three different time phases. The initiation phase, the quasi steady phase when the reconnection rate is about 0 0.1 and the declining phase when the reconnecting uh, flux is decreasing in the system and as a result you can see less and less reconnection rate in the system. So this is the picture of reconnection that we're studying and on the right hand side the out of plane current density that you're seeing is somewhere in the quasi steady phase and that is our concerned time of analysis. All right so in this I will show you a movie of the spectral behavior on the left hand side you have the out of of plane velocity. On the right hand side, you have the magnetic energy spectrum. This is the picture at t equals to zero. Let's start the movie. Or so immediately, once you start the system, you can see that the energy spectrum has significant changes in, in, in itself. But since up to this point, there is no reconnection started. So therefore nothing much has happened over the inertial scales. Now, the reconnection almost starts at about 220, 250 or something like that. And once you approach that particular time, you see this small structures propagating towards, all right, somewhere here. So here you see these small structures propagating towards the inertial scale. And then if you look onto the left-hand side, you see how the out-of-plane velocity is changing. So the system has already entered the quasi steady phase. And this is about the time of analysis. Now in this, let me pause this for a second. In this time of analysis, which is about 463, 466 or something. So in that time of analysis, you see that the magnetic energy spectrum has a well-developed negative five thirds somewhere here across the inertial scale, which was initially not present in the system. Now, as the system evolves again, you see the magnetic islands getting round and round in shape. The reconnecting flux has now decreased. And eventually, this particular part out here is falling down. And the slope of 5 third is now disappearing. So there is, as you can see here, almost no flux. The system has already entered the declining phase. And now you see there is nothing happening across the inner seal scales. So let's see this. I think the time it goes is about 900 omega ci or something. All right, so the main picture that I want you to take from this is that the energy spectrum evolved with reconnection. As the reconnection progressed, the ion inertial scales in the system pretty much went close to the negative five third slope, which again disappeared as reconnection evolved, sorry, as the total reconnection was stopping, or let's say the reconnecting flux was decreasing in the system. This shows a direct correlation, this, sorry, this shows a direct correlation between the reconnection rate and the uh, energy across the inertial scales. So now one question that people would ask would be, all right, so we see that five third, five third, let's say we see, we agree, but then what is giving that five third might be a point of argument. So here, what we do is we divide our spatial domain into three different regions. So this is the exact uh, reconnection picture that you, you saw previously. Here you see the magnetic field, out of plane magnetic field. What we did here is we defined the reconnection region into three different zones. The first zone is the island. The second zone is the uh, this, this reason current state, and then the separatrix and the exhaust that we call DES DES reason. So the diffusion reason exhaust and the separatrix is what we label as reason two, the green curve. And the outermost inflow reason is what we call reason three. 
Now, since these regions are statistically not uh, of a proper shape, calculating uh, the Fourier spectrum in this would require some filter function, which would, which would of course, so it's statistical nature because of less points. Therefore, calculating the Fourier spectrum in these regions was not, uh, uh, was not the preferred choice. So therefore, what we did was we calculated the second order structure function, which is also a representation of the second order statistics in the three different regions. As you see on the right hand side, you see the second order structure function for lag across x axis. On the left hand side, you see the second order structure function for lag across y axis. One thing that I'd like to emphasize is the system started pretty much anisotropically, which we'd see in, 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 in a few slides. So even up to this point, the system has not entered into its isotropic phase, which means the total energy is still dominated by the energy across the y modes, or let's say energy across the y axis. So because of that, the energy across x axis is not pretty much significant. So we neglect this for our discussion. If you look into this right hand side, which is a representation of energy across the y, y scales or y axis, you see that the contribution coming from the green curve and red curve is pretty much the same up to this scale. So once again, the green curve is the reason of reconnection for us, which includes diffusion, exhaust, and separatrix. The reason one is the reason of the island. So what this figure suggests is that the contribution at this point coming to the energy spectrum is because of both reason one and two, which means the contribution of reason two cannot be neglected. And that is where the reconnection is happening, reason two. So next we talk about the isotropy and anisotropy that I previously mentioned. So here, as I said previously, what you see here is the total uh, 2D energy spectrum over time. Here is the KX wave numbers, KY wave numbers. So what you're seeing here is the magnetic energy, but in two dimensions. So initially the, all, the, all the magnetic energy is across Y Fourier modes. But as reconnection starts, and as you enter the quasi steady phase, you see a big development of energy being transferred across all other modes. As you move further, somewhere at around 656, I think this is almost the start of the declining phase in reconnection. You see these tail-like structures here, which pretty much cor corresponds to the angle made by the separatrix in the system. As one moves almost at the end of the declining phase, you see a pretty much uh, almost a rectangle, or if one isolates the outermost picture, something that's very close to a circle. So the system that initially had its energy distribution like this, all across the Y mode, finally redistributed its energy with all over the modes and then developed an isotropic picture. So what this suggests is that reconnection is at the same time also driving isotropy in the system, and maybe that through the help of the islands. In this picture, you can see the same thing, but through a measure called the Seblin angle. So Seblin angle basically measures the amount of energy across the Y modes with that of X modes as we have defined. So if the Seblin angle is close to one, so if this number is close to one, then the Seblin angle would be close to 45 degrees, which suggests that the system is in perfect isotropy. As you can see here, the system starts perfect anisotropically with the Seblin angle close to 70 degrees. These, these are in degrees. So as you move further, and by the end of the simulation, the angle is pretty much close to 48 or something, suggesting that reconnection is driving isotropy. All right, so here we see the time evolution of the energy across the uh, across the scales. So on the top top plot, you see the time evolution of the magnetic energy spectrum. So one slice somewhere here was what I was showing when I was saying uh, the energy spectrum exhibits a negative five star. That was one slice. So these are the time evolution of those particular energy spectrum. On the bottom, you see energy at the inertial scales in blue and the red curve basically shows you the reconnection rate and this is time of course so as you can see as reconnection gets going 
you have these pictures are, are, are developing in the system. So there is this arrow that shows that the energy is actually being transferred across the inertial scales. So as reconnection <clears throat> rate is pretty much steady, you have this plateau in the energy in the uh, ion inertial scales. And as reconnection starts to fall down, the energy falls down as well, showing a pretty good correlation between the energy in the inertial scales with the reconnection rate. Now, one question would then be, all right, so we see this correlation between reconnection rate, we see all these kinds of energy transfer. So what basically is motivating this energy transfer? Is this because of something that can be called a cascade because of turbulence? So is this turbulence, sorry, is this transfer due to a turbulence cascade is the motivation of uh, our next study. So before we move further, I'd like to give you a quick review or overview of how energy transfer in turbulence occurs. So energy transfer in turbulence is basically a cascade where there is a constant transfer of energy from one scales to the, the other scales. So basically there is this cascade as one can compare that with this uh, waterfall picture in here. So on the right hand side, you see the energy spectrum with a wave number. The smallest wave number would imply the largest scales, which is what is called the energy containing scales. The smallest scales would imply larger wave number, which is where the viscous dissipation dominates the picture and energy dissipates. In between these two ranges, the energy containing range and the viscous dissipation range, you see this inertial subrange, which is what we often hear in turbulence. And it is this range where the energy transfers at a constant rate. So there is this constant rate of energy transfer in turbulence, what we call as an energy cascade. We can also visualize this in lag space. So in order to do that, we basically uh, use the fact that lag or length scale is basically inverse of the Fourier number. So whatever you're seeing here, you observe here, whatever you're observing here, you would see here. And basically the intermediate scales would almost be the same. Here on the bottom plot, we are uh, showing the second order structure function. The second order structure function as we used earlier is defined as this, where the average would be over the whole ensemble. And uh, the picture would basically say that at the largest scales, the second order structure function is basically the amount of energy contained. So you can visualize second order structure function as the amount of energy contained within a sphere of radius L, or let's say in lag space, if you have a sphere of lag L, then second order structure function would basically be the amount of total energy contained within that sphere of lag L. So basically in turbulence, you would observe a negative five third slope somewhere here in the energy spectrum. And corresponding to that, you would see a positive two thirds slope somewhere in the inter intermediate scale for the second order structure function. So this is a slide that I copied from my previous talk and uh, I think I forgot to edit it. All right. So once we have that, how do we measure the cascade? So in order to measure the cascade, we use the fact that the energy transfer rate or let's say the cascade rate is actually dependent on the second order structure functions and also the third order structure functions. The third order structure functions that we're interested in is Y and H. So the definition of Y and H, as you see here, is mixed third order structure functions. The averages are once again, the ensemble average. As you saw previously in the um, second order structure function plot, so the time rate of change of second order structure function is what would dominate the largest scales. The divergence of the aglum flux or the MSD flux is what would dominate the inertial range. And the Hull flux is something that becomes significant at the scales where Hull physics is important. At scales smaller than that, dissipation comes into the picture. Let's visualize this much better using the von Karman Haworth equation. So, von Karman Haworth equation, as you see in, in this slide, is basically the equation for incompressible Hull magnet hydrodynamics. Epsilon here is the total dissipation rate in the system. D is actually a lag dependent dissipation, which is uh, negligible outside the uh, dissipation scales or, or it's big in the scales where viscosity kind of plays a significant role. The DSDD term is the change of energy inside lag L. 
the red curve is the magnetohydrodynamic energy flow. So it basically implies how much energy is flowing in or going out of the lag sphere. The same is true for this Hull term, which is once again significant at the Hull scales. So in order to bet better visualize each individual term, we have a picture here. Please note that this picture is a picture that is only achieved in ideal turbulence. So our, tur our, our system of simulation would never be that. So once again, for ideal turbulence at largest scales, or let's say the energy containing scale, you have this DSTT term dominating the whole picture. So the blue curve is dominating and the other, cur other curves are, other terms are negligible. So therefore that would correspond to the total dissipation. Likewise, if you move towards a smaller scale, you see the rate curve starts evolving and in the inertial range, or let's say the much part of the inertial range, the MSD energy flow dominates. So therefore in this scale, that is what is driving the dissipation. And that is what we call the cascade. Now you're still the inertial range, but smaller scales of the inertial range, the whole term comes into the picture and that is where the whole term dominates. Likewise, if you move towards dissipation scale represented by D, this small D here, if you move towards a small dissipation scale, the whole term starts getting smaller, but as you see, the dotted curve, the black curve, which is B as a function of L starts coming into the picture. One thing to note is that if you take this DL on the other side, the sign of this DL is different to the sign of other individual terms. What that suggests is DL is actually giving you the amount of dissipation outside of sphere of lag L in contrast to what other terms are suggesting. So as you move into the largest dissipation scale, there is no dissipation happening in terms of lag or in terms of viscous effects, right? Because viscosity is only significant in this scale. As you move towards smaller lag and go towards lag almost equals to zero, then there is, I mean, outside this point, there is this range where viscosity dominates. Therefore, if you sum all that dissipation, that would finally give you the maximum value of this lag dependent dissipation. All right, so keeping all this in mind, the behavior of each individual term over each significant length, we move forward and uh, look into our system. All right, so this is on the right hand side is the system of reconnection that we previously studied and found the negative five third slope in the energy spectrum. Now, what we do here is we compare the exact system of laminar reconnection with that of kinetic turbulence. So this system that you see here on the left is a turbulence or let's say a kinetic peak simulation of turbulence. The system is undriven with initial Fourier modes lying in between two and four. The out of plane current density for these two systems are what you see in the picture. Now, if you only look into the picture, you have a feeling, you, I'm pretty sure you will have a feeling that these two systems are totally different. I mean, they look different, right? So if you look into the energy transfer behavior of these two totally different systems, Systems, as you might see, then the energy transfer behavior would be different. They would not behave the same. So therefore we analyze the energy transfer behavior. Here are the details of the simulation of the reconnection and turbulence. Please note that these simulations are different and we are aware of the fact that these simulations are different. So therefore change in initial conditions in this does not matter our analysis much because we are qualitatively uh, looking into the behavior of energy transfer. But few things we try to make the same is the background density, such so that that don't change things much. And the other one is the initial turbulence amplitude, which is the same in both the system. All right, so here we see the energy transfer behavior, which is basically we're plotting the von karman haworth equation for the system of turbulence and the system of reconnection. Let's start with turbulence. At the largest scale, as you see, DSDT is dominating. As you move towards a smaller scale, the green curve comes into the picture, which is the divergence of the Aglum flux or the, or, or the mixed third order function, third order structure function Y. And as you move towards a smaller scale, you see that the orange curve, which is the divergence of the Hull flux is coming into the picture. So the dotted curve actually is sum of all these three. So as you see here, it is basically the sum. Here, the green curve is basically almost equal to the sum, showing that this is what is dominating the total energy transfer. Now, one thing that you didn't see here is the D term, right? 
So the D-term in collisionless plasma is not defined properly or not agreed upon. There is this pi D-term, which is, is um, a significant uh, term that is that people have said that would address the collisionless dissipation in, in, in our system, but we have not actually gone with that. So therefore the dissipation term is absent here. So, and at this scale, the black curve is smaller because that is where the dissipation term would dominate. So if we had that dissipation term and if that dissipation term was added in this picture, then this curve would pretty much gain that uh, one value here. The other thing to note is we're normalizing each term with epsilon star, which is basically the uh, rate of change of ion flow and magnetic energy in the system at that particular time. So we basically calculate those energies at that, at that particular time using all the particles and uh, find the, its, its time rate of change with the time of analysis or whatever our time of analysis is. And we basically normalize all the quantities using that. So in a proper case, that would correspond simply to one because that is what the dissipation is basically happening in our system. All right, if you look into the bottom picture, you have this second order structure function, which has a two thirds slope towards the um, larger length scales, as you can see. So you would expect, actually expect a proper two third, even in this range, but you don't see that, which is because of the limitation of uh, our computations that we are not able to separate the scales very well. Once again, one thing to note from the leftmost figure is that in the inertial scale, you have this divergence of Y term dominating and almost being equal to the black term. That is the behavior one should take from this turbulence simulation. Now let's, next, let's move on to this middle picture. This is the reconnection system as it enters the quasi steady phase. So in the early quasi steady phase, there is this scales where the blue curve is dominating. As one move towards intermediate scale, the green curve is pretty equal to the black curve or the sum. As one move towards much further scales, the orange curve is significant. One thing that you might see here is that the two third in the structure function is not well exhibited. But at the same time, the other thing that you should keep in mind is that this is the same system that exhibits a negative five third in the magnetic energy spectrum. So as one move towards the mid quasi steady phase, the system is, so the system has been there in the steady phase for some time. So at this point, you see the larger scales again, dominated by the DSTT term, the smaller scales dominated by the divergence of white term, and that the smaller scales, again, the orange curve is significant. Now, if you look into this three pictures of energy transfer behavior in turbulence and reconnection, what you would see is the scales where each individual term is dominating. One thing that is different in this reconnection picture is that there are two plateaus in contrast to what you see here. And that is most certainly due to the uh, initial condition that we have in the picture. So as the system gets in the steady phase, there is this amount of energy that the system would lock in because the largest scale or the correlation scale for this reconnection picture is almost equal to the box size. And that would be uh, calculated using what the initial wave numbers were in the system. All right, so basically this picture would suggest that the energy transfer behavior in our system, laminar system of reconnection is the same as the turbulence picture. In order to strengthen that case further, we see here the time evolution of the divergence of Y term, the time evolution of the DSDD term. And on the bottom, you have the reconnection rate in red. In blue, you have the energy in, uh, sorry, in green, you have the energy in the inertial scales, the magnetic energy. While in blue, you have the sum of these two terms taken at a lag of 90. So the thing, I mean, the, there are pretty, pretty much informations, a lot of information in these upper two plots. But one thing that I'd like to take away from this is that as the reconnection progresses in the system, you see these structures, these big structures being developed in divergence of Y and DSDT. The system is pretty much in quasi steady phase. That's our time of analysis here. And pretty much in quasi steady phase, this scales persist, the structures persist, the values are big. And as the system 
the re as, as the reconnection stops, or let's say the reconnecting flux decreases, you see that these structures go away. So basically what this says is that the reconnection rate or basically reconnection happening in the system is pretty much correlated with this uh, structures, the divergence of the aglum flux structures that would develop in the system. You see some kind of oscillations here in the picture, and that would probably be because of uh, uh, some MSD kind of oscillations due to the technicalities of the simulation. So if we had often uh, taken into account of much uh, resolved time scales, then we believe that would have gone. But again, more or less, what's more interesting is the correlation that we see in this picture. All right. So previously, we did not have any guide field in the system. Now we added guide field, and, and now we are trying to see how things change with respect to the guide field. So here we have four different systems with guide fields of 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1, and 2. These are the out of plane current density when the amount of reconnected flux is about the same in the system. So basically, we're trying to see that the width of the island, or let's say the amount of flux that is being uh, helping for reconnection, is pretty much the same in the system. So now here is the analysis of the magnetic energy spectrum on the left. You see that the spectrum for all these five simulations pretty much gives you the negative five third slope. Therefore, addition of guide field would not change that behavior much. In would not change that behavior much, but support that in favor of turbulence. As you can see from the right hand plot, this is the electric field energy spectrum. So here is the guide field zero run for guide field zero, the electric field energy spectrum did not have anything significant. But as you started increasing the guide field for the largest guide field case of two, you see a small region where the slope is negative five third. Now, if you keep on increasing the guide field, probably you would get a more, um, more better picture of, of the spectrum. But anyway, this is, this is the fact that addition of guide field is actually supporting the system to be more turbulent. All right, so here we have the energy transfer behavior for all these five systems. Once again, one thing that one should focus on is the trend that these systems are behaving. The largest scale DSDT is dominating because that is where the energy is contained. As one moves towards intermediate scale, the divergence of Y is dominating, which is what would drive the cascade. And as one goes towards this small scales where Hall physics is significant, there is this yellow, sorry, orange curve coming into the picture. Now, this cross crossing point between the blue and green curve is, I mean, they don't follow a proper trend. Probably that is because of the difficulty that we have in choosing a well defined time to analyze these systems, because people might argue that. If you're looking into the turbulence like behavior, you should choose a time when the mean square current is maximum in the system. But since this is a turb, sorry, reconnect and run, we're actually focusing on the time when the flux is almost constant. The other thing that one should note is the reason this green curve is dominating is being extended as one looks into higher guide field case. And that is probably because as one increases the guide field, there is this decrease in the Larmor radius, particle Larmor radius, which means the MSD scale physics comes significant at smaller scales. The other thing to note is the smallest scales where the black curve is pretty much off from one. And that is because of the dissipation being significant at those scales. So as I mentioned earlier, the dissipation for collisionless plasma is not well defined as it is for magnet hydrodynamic plasmas. So probably we can find the answer in pi d term, which is the pressure, or let's say the diver divergence of the pressure tensor term, and that would probably answer our question. The other thing that we have made as an approximation is we're assuming incompressible Hall MSD. Probably if one uses the compressible Hall MSD, then that would also address some compressibility issues that would be significant at these scales. Now at these scales, the compressibility issue is not a problem because as you see, the blue curve pretty much fits with the black curve and that is pretty much close to one, which is what one would expect since everything is normalized to epsilon star, which is the time rate of change of 
ion flow and magnetic energy. So, all right. So finally coming to the conclusion here, what we have shown over the last 30 minutes or so is that the classic reconnection picture that you see in, in, this, in this double current sheet here exhibits Kolmogorov-like spectrum and also has a energy transfer that is similar to one would similar to what one would observe in turbines. Therefore, the classic picture of re reconnection has Kolmogorov-like spectrum and energy cascade, which is something that even a turbulent system has, suggesting a larger degree of similarities between the classic reconnection and turbulence. So using this, one might be curious if there is a universal law that governs both reconnection and turbulence. Thank you so much. With that, I'm open for questions. All right, thank you, Subash, for a wonderful mm -hmm. talk. Um, so we have a question from sure. Eric Lund. Uh, it's on slide 14, um, the slide that's labeled 14 of 27. Uh, in order to understand this slide, which direction does the magnetic field point in the simulation? Uh, so I think it's back from here. So which direction does magnetic yeah, field? Yeah, this one okay. here. Okay, so basically the magnetic field, the reconnecting field is along the X direction. And uh, the structures, all right, so let me start with this slide in here. All right, so this is what we have, right? So the reconnecting field is along X, but that is a function of something along Y. So basically when you start at T equals to zero, the energy would basically be because of the variation in Y. And that is why you see here, the energy is, is all along the Y modes, right? But as the system evolves, as you see here, sometime here, let's say, right? Sometime here, you see different kinds of structures coming into the system, which means there is a significant amount of out of plane uh, magnetic field being developed. And uh, in doing that, the energy initially along the Y mode is being distributed along different modes. May that be X, may that be Y. And uh, as, as it, as the system moves further in time, it seems like the energy is more concentrated towards smaller modes and that also towards X and Y, both the modes suggesting isotropy in the system. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I also have a question regarding sure. the two different simulations, the um, turbulent one and the reconnection one. Yes. Um, what's the difference between the two simulations? Is it just the initialization and Yes, so, so the difference would be the one that you see as a reconnection simulation initially has two current sheets, right? And, and the system is basically being developed or the reconnection is basically being developed because of perturbation in the magnetic flux and because of particle noises or some noise that just comes into the system. On the right-hand side, you have initialization with Fourier modes basically being concentrated into into this, this reason that you have. So this system is designed so as to have multiple current seat structures or multiple islands as you, you would like to develop in the system, which means this system is pretty much occupied all over the domain. Whereas this system has only two current seats present in the system and is, is pretty much empty, except if you just ignore these current seats, right? So therefore, characteristically, I think these systems are pretty much different on what they represent. I would say the one on the right basically represents the classic current sheet picture of reconnection with only two current sheets. The one on the left, the turbulence would basically imply a lot of stuff going on, a lot of things happening. Okay. Um, so we have another question by Marcos yes. mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. regarding the three regions that you split the simulation into. In terms of region two, is it possible to further split region two so that you can check what region contributes more to the turbulence rate? Actually, we thought of doing that. That's a very nice question. But the thing would be, since you're like coming to smaller and smaller regions, you would have less points. So statistically, we were not sure if those points are like the limitations or the number of points were pretty good compared to the number of points that we have for the other regions. We could basically do that. Let's say divide something here, right? But then 
When you do that, the maximum lag that you can get between one point to the other point would be very limited, the first thing. The second thing would also be because of the number of points, there are less number of points where you can do the analysis, the statistics might not be trusted. So if we can get a system which is big enough, where this thing is big enough, then maybe we can do that. Yes. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all the questions we have. Uh, thank you again for a wonderful talk. And thank, thank you for you so coming much. right after your EGU talk. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Kyle, for the opportunity. Um, so next week, we do have a holiday. Uh, so we will be taking a break. Our next seminars will be our next set of early career seminars. And we have Jinbei Wang and Harsha Gurum, who will be speaking at our next set starting June 6th. So I hope everyone has a wonderful week. And for those that have the long weekend, I hope you enjoy it.